morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to today's Tenemao Talks. Uh, my name is Wei Xiao. I work at ARM. Uh, thank you very much for joining today's session. I will be your host today. So before we get started, I want to share a great news with you guys. Our global meetup community reached 3,000 members as of yesterday. That's a big milestone for us. And thank you very much for your continued support and enthusiasm. First, we would like to thank all of our Tenyama Tech sponsors at Impulse, Maximum Integrated, and Sensense. So if you want to sponsor future talks, please email Becky at tenyamao.org. So on Tuesday, July 21st, we will have another two talks scheduled for you. So the first talk is from Toma at DSP Group who is going to introduce AI and machine learning SOC for ultra low power mobile and IoT devices. The second talk will be from Natajin at Qualcomm, who is going to talk about how to push the limits of ultra low power computer vision for tiny mail applications. The talks are scheduled at 8 a.m. Pacific time. If you want to present in our future sessions, please email your proposals to talks at tenmail.org. Our first talk today is from Zuzana uh, Yajizuma, who works at Dinmart. Her talk today is benchmarking and improving NN execution on digital signal processor versus custom accelerator for hearing instruments. Susanna graduated from Technical University of Denmark last year with a master's degree. She is pursuing her PhD degree with DMARD, which is a group that offers solutions and service to help people with hearing loss. Susanna, welcome. Thank you very much, Wei, for the kind introduction and in general for this great opportunity to present a part of our work here today. I would also like to say a huge thank you to everyone who has decided to join today's webinar. And I really hope it's going to be interesting for you. What I'm going to talk about is how we implemented neural network support on both a dedicated neural network engine, as well as a digital signal processor used by DEMAND in some of its hearing instruments. Then we use the keyword spotting neural network as our benchmark model to evaluate the performance of these two implementations. But before proceeding into further details, I'd like to first of all introduce our full research team consisting of Adrian, Oscar, Evangelia, and Jens. We were all working on this project together and um, my colleagues deserve equal credits for what I'm presenting now. I would also like to say a few words about Demon. Uh, so as Wei has just mentioned, we are an international hearing healthcare group that provides services and solutions uh, to people who suffer from hearing loss. Our headquarter is in Denmark, a little bit outside of Copenhagen, but uh, we have companies all around the world, in fact, in more than 30 countries. So Demand is a parent company to many brands, such as Otikan, where I actually belong to. And what we are doing at Otikan is that we are going through the entire development flow of a hearing instrument. It means that we are starting at DSP algorithms and we are ending at taping out our own chips. Furthermore, Otikan has also its own research center called Ericsholm that's also located in Denmark and its main focus is on audiological research. Now I'd like to introduce you um, the overview of this presentation. So what we are going to go through together today. First of all, I'll start talking about the motivation. It means why do we even want to have hearing instruments um, with neural networks? Then I'll talk a bit about the benchmark model, the keyword spotting neural network, and right after we'll start digging into the Oticon's digital signal processor, referred to as DXDSP. We'll also talk about the neural network engine with its three optimization techniques that actually made the engine outperform the XDSP significantly. We'll have a look at these results at the end of the presentation, followed by the conclusion. Let me start with the motivation, because the first question could really be, why do we even want to have neural networks inside of hearing instruments? Well, the current state of the art hearing instruments have already some um, automatic features such as noise reduction or environment classification or adjustments of some hearing instrument settings. 
However, they are still pre-programmed to a number of specific scenarios. It means that the current adaptive algorithms inside of hearing instruments cannot really improve their behavior over time in response to some sensor information. It means that they lack learning. And this is something that we want to provide our hearing instruments with. We want to give them the ability to learn, since this is an important feature when it comes to personalized hearing instruments. There is no such thing as a generic healing loss and each patient requires their own needs and their own requirements. And we believe and we envision that with the help of neural networks, uh, this is actually possible. And we can really give the patients the possibility to experience this personalization. Of course, at the same time, we have to keep in mind that there are many limiting factors when it comes to hearing instruments, because these are really small devices with tiny chips inside. So we talk about limiting factors such as memory, area, power, and throughput. We could also implement neural networks in the current uh, hearing instruments because hearing instruments are multi-core processor platforms that are supported by several DSPs. However, the execution time and energy dissipation are really prohibitive to do so. And that's why we are coming with this alternative solution that's our neural network engine. And both the neural network engine and non-code DHP are evaluated using the keyword spotting benchmark model. Um, this pre-trained deep neural network is taken from the Hello Edge keyword spotting on microcontrollers paper. And it is a fully connected feed-forward neural network that consists of 250 inputs and three hidden layers of 144 neurons. The last layer consists of 12 neurons, which correspond to 10 keywords that you can see in the following slides and the two non-keyword categories, which are silence, it means there's nothing present in the audio recording, and unknown, it means that the neural network cannot really categorize the keyword into any of these categories. So the input into this deep neural network is a flattened feature matrix, and the data set itself comes from the very well-known Google speech command data set that actually uh, consists of these one second audio recordings. Now let's start having a look, a look at our digital signal processor, the XDSP. And the XDSP really represents our generic audio DSP that is used as a baseline for comparison. And it has a 96-bit vector data path that supports four 24-bit uh, fixed point elements. And these are in 519 format. It means that we are using five integer bits and 19 fractional bits. Another important thing to mention in case of XDSP is um, that its multiply accumulate unit, unit is able to perform four multiplications and accumulate the result in a single accumulator. And this is also visualized in the following figure. However, as you might see, there is an issue with this design and it is the fact that we are only able to process one neuron at a time, which is very inefficient because when we need to process the subsequent neuron within the same layer, we basically have to reload all the inputs again and again. And this issue along with others is actually addressed in our neural network engine that proposes three optimization techniques mitigating all these issues. So the neural network engine that I'll be now talking about uh, has the following three optimization techniques. The first one is word length reduction, where we are actually using eight bits instead of 24 bits for all our neural network parameters, because 24 bits are not really necessary for neural network inference. The second optimization are several multiply accumulate units in parallel. So that's something that I've just been talking about when we were processing only one neuron at a time in case of the XDSP. Furthermore, we also want to reduce memory traffic and we are using uh, the input and output stationary techniques for this. And last but not least, uh, we are introducing our new technique, which is called two-step scaling. Uh, that is actually uh, handling our MAC products that need to be stored back in the memory in a reduced format. And furthermore, it also uh, makes our neural network engine execute in a deterministic number of cycles for a given network. Now, I'd like to walk you through the three optimization techniques that I've just outlined. And the first one I'd like to start with is the reduced word length. So as I said, we are using eight bits for representing all our parameters. It means our inputs, weights, biases, activations. And we are, for example, quantizing our weights and biases um, statically while the activations are quantized on the fly. It means for each layer individually. And I'll get back to this uh, quantization when I'll be talking about uh, the two-step scaling method. 
Uh, so what we can see in this plot is actually the accuracy results for the different word length that we tested out. First of all, I'd like to also emphasize that these numbers are obviously not the state-of-the-art numbers because also our main focus, our objective, was not really to train the best neural network, but our focus was uh, to run an efficient inference on edge devices. So back to the plot, we can see that uh, with our original neural network uh, that was trained for 32-bit floating point, we achieved the accuracy of approximately 82%. And then going down to 24, 12, or 8 bits actually didn't really um, influence the accuracy that much. However, we can't say the same thing about the 6-bit implementation. And that's why we decided to go with 8 bits for our inference. The second optimization technique are our several multiply accumulates in parallel. So we have here also several considerations. The first of them is that we are still keeping our 96-bit memory interface, as it was in the case of the XDSP. And now, since we have 8 bits uh, for our parameters, we can actually process 12 neurons or 12 elements at a time instead of 4, as it was the case in the XDSP. So in the following figure, what you can see on the left is uh, the old multiply accumulate unit in the XDSP, while on the right you can see our optimized multiply accumulate unit um, in our neural network engine. And what you can see here is that we are actually loading 12 inputs and we are at the same time processing 12 neurons at a time. And I'd like to now show you an example of how much this uh, input and output stationary processing techniques actually impacted the performance. It means how much they impacted our memory read. So first of all, um, there is also another consideration for this example, and it is that uh, we are assuming that both the XDSP and also the neural network engine actually use the same word length uh, for parameters. It means we are assuming these eight bits so that we can really show the impact of uh, these data reuse techniques. It means that if we are now processing a layer in our keyword spotting neural network that consists of 144 neurons, we know that we need to, two, we need to feed 250 inputs into this layer. And with our 12 elements within a vector, uh, we are actually able to split these 250 inputs into 21 vectors. And that's something you can see also in the table for both the XDSP and the neural network engine. The difference comes when we actually want to process uh, our first layer. It means the layer that consists of 144 neurons. When we have a look at the XDSP, we can see the issue we talked about before. Every time we want to process a new neuron, we have to reload all the inputs again and again for every single neuron within a layer. This means that we have to actually multiply these 21 vectors by all our neurons within a layer in this specific case by 144 neurons. This is not the case for the neural network engine where we are processing 12 neurons or 12 elements at a time. It means that we are actually decreasing um, this factor by 12. So we are, only, uh, need, we are only in a need to actually load these input vectors 12 times. What we can see in case of uh, weight vector loads is that uh, it hasn't really changed for uh, the XDSP and it didn't really change for the neural network engine either. And that's because we are really working with fully connected neural networks and we are loading every single way. If we scale it or if we basically apply this process to all the other layers within this keyword spotting neural network, we are then getting the total number of these memory reads uh, that are performed during the inference. And we can see that for the XDSP, we need more than 13,000, while for the neural network engine is almost a half, around 7,000. And since today, we are also comparing the XDSP that is able to process four inputs at a time, uh, we need to scale this number up to see what is the actual difference between the XDSP and the neural network engine. And if we do that, we can see that the XDSP actually requires almost 40,000 memory reads while the neural network engine requires only 7,000. So there is a difference of almost six times. The last optimization technique I'd like to describe is the two-step scaling. And the two-step scaling solves inefficient individual scaling of activations in our XDSP. So as I've just been describing, in the XDSP, we are able to process only one neuron at a time. And this is, again, something you can see in the following figure and in the following example I'm going to describe. 
So let's say that uh, we have computed our make product for the first neuron and we were storing it in our accumulator uh, with higher precision. And let's assume also that our memory is able to store only six bit data. So what we need to do is to take this result from our accumulator and in the simplest case, basically right shift it to actually get the format which is required. Everything is fine until we get to the second neuron, because as you can see for the green neuron, we actually need to perform two uh, right shifts. And this means that at this point, we are getting our results out of the proportion. They are not in the same ratio. So what we need to do in order to fix this issue is that we need to refetch the previously computed neuron, in our case, this blue neuron, and shift it by the missing number of positions. So in this case, it's one position. And as you can hear, this is very inefficient because first of all, we are increasing energy dissipation by refetching the already computed results. And we are also introducing, or we might compromise basically the real time processing because all of a sudden we are introducing this non-determinism in the equation. However, this is not the case for the neural network engine because it uses this two-step scaling method. And furthermore, this two-step scaling method also makes the neural network engine execute in a deterministic number of clock cycles for a given network without adding additional clock cycles for performing the scaling. And in the following slide, we'll have a look at this two-step scaling method. And um, as the title suggests, it consists actually of two steps. So we are scaling within a vector and we are scaling across a layer. So first of all, let's have a look at the scaling within a vector. And this is happening when we are writing the result from our accumulator back into memory. Again, I've provided here a small example that you can um, see in the figure where we are processing um, some neurons within our neural network. And currently we are processing layer L2 where the inputs are coming from layer L1. Uh, what we are doing with our layer, layer L2 is that we are splitting it into these groups of 12 elements as I described before. For simplicity, in this figure, only groups of four neurons are shown. And then after we are done with performing, basically the multiply accumulates for every group of uh, these neurons, we are finding a scaling factor which corresponds to the biggest number of shifts that are required for actually fitting the biggest number within this vector back into memory. And then all the other elements within the same vector will be shifted by the same number by the same scaling factor we've just computed. And this is done for every of these groups. So in this specific example, the green, blue, and orange groups will have two, one, and three number of shifts respectively. Then at the end of the layer, when we are done with performing this scaling for each of our groups, we are finding the biggest uh, number, the biggest scaling factor across a layer. In this case, it is number three from the orange group. And this number, along with also the local scaling factors, is very important in the second step, when we are going to do the scaling across a layer. So let's have a look at it now. This scaling across a layer is happening when we are reading the results in the next layer as inputs. It means currently we are, let's say, processing layer L3, and the inputs into this layer L3 are provided from our layer 2 we've just been computing. And we know that um, the elements are within the ratio or in the same ratio within our smaller groups of neurons, within our smaller groups of elements. However, this is not the case from a global perspective and we need to fix this. So what we are doing is that we are taking our biggest scaling factor across a layer and we are subtracting our local scaling factor from it in order to obtain actually the additional shifts for each of our groups of neurons. And this is happening before we are actually performing any multiply accumulate operations. So in this case, we know that we actually require one, two, and zero shifts for green, blue, and orange groups of neurons respectively. Now, um, we are going through these three optimization techniques that you can actually see now in the following data path. And um, I would like to actually describe how these optimization techniques also cooperate together, especially when it, come, uh, when it comes to the two-step scaling method and uh, the multiple multiply accumulate units. And this data path consists of uh, three most important modules, which are load input, multiply accumulate, and shift result. 
The control part that consists of a finite state machine or some configuration modules and address generation modules is not shown for simplicity and clarity. Firstly, I'd like to start describing the neural network engine memory, which is a dedicated neural network engine memory. And uh, it is actually divided into seven smaller memory instances. And these instances are preferred over a single big memory because of the dynamic power we are trying to reduce. Because that one is a result of our read operations that are really dominating the inference. Uh, the increased leakage is solved by actually putting the different blocks into retention when necessary. What you can also see here is that the memory is uh, split into three different address blocks. And these are blocks 0, 1, and read weights. Um, what is happening here is that block 0 and block 1 change their roles, their responsibilities, which are read inputs and write results after every completed layer because also our neural network engine performs on a per layer basis. It means that, uh, for example, if block zero would do for retrieving the inputs that are marked with a blue rectangle in the figure, and block one was used for uh, writing the results, which is marked with this green rectangle, then in the next step, uh, their roles will be switched. So block zero will be actually used for writing the result, while block one will be used for retrieving the inputs. And then the third block we have here, which is read weights, is just used for storing basically the bias values and weights. Now let's have a look at the individual modules. Uh, the first one is load input module. And this one is responsible for actually handling the second part of our two-step scaling method. It means that it's handling these additional shifts that we need to perform. Um, as you can see in the figure, we are loading the inputs from the memory along with the additional number of shifts that are computed in our shift result module that I'll get back to shortly. And after we are performing the shifting, we are passing the field input in our MEC module along with weight from the memory um, that will be used for the computations. But before also performing any multiply accumulate operations, we are preloading the accumulators with bias values so that we are actually saving uh, one addition every time. And this operation also serves as a reset, basically, for our accumulators. So once we are done with all the multiply accumulate operations, we are moving to our scaling logic. And the scaling logic is responsible for the first part of our two-step scaling method. It means when we are finding the local scaling factor for a group of neurons. Once we are finding, or once we have found this scaling factor, we are scaling all the values within this vector and we are storing them in the memory while this scaling factor is passed to our last module called shift result. And as you can see, this shift result module actually consists of uh, two buffers, which are shift buffer zero and shift buffer one. And one of these modules is responsible for storing the scaling factors that are currently being computed, while the other one is responsible for retrieving the scaling factors that were computed in the previous layer. And then after each completed layer, they are again switching their responsibilities. So in this specific example, we can see that shift buffer zero is actually responsible for storing the scaling factors, while shift buffer one is responsible for calculating the additional number of shifts called extra shifts, which are passed to our load input module we were actually describing at the beginning. So this was kind of a compressed explanation or description of how these optimization techniques are implemented. And now I'd like to get the result, so the comparison of the XDHP and the neural network engine. First of all, the energy estimations we are uh, providing here are based on multiply accumulate and memory excesses, because these are really dominating uh, the inference and we wanted to actually compare the two implementations on equal terms. I can say that these energy in, in estimations are really matching very well also with our synthesis results. What you can also see in the table um, are basically results per inference. It means processing of a one second audio file where the accuracy itself is based on almost 5,000 audio recordings. As you can also see from this table, um, the neural network engine really outperforms the XDSP significantly in all aspects. First of all, the memory capacity was decreased three times, which of course makes sense because we are now using eight bits for representing our neural network parameters instead of 24 bits. 
But another contributing factor to this is our optimized approach of reusing memory space. If you remember with the switching actually the different blocks after each completed layer. Then the memory traffic was also reduced by five and a half times where we went from basically 470 kilobytes down to 85 kilobytes for the XDSP and neural network engine respectively. Another big improvement in this case is that our neural network engine only uses vector operations, uh, while the XDSP still needs to perform 888 baseline scalar operations for our keyword spotting neural network. And these are needed for loading our bias values and also storing the results back into memory. But as you remember, we were talking a lot about the overflows and refetching the values again and again when we need to actually scale them so that all the results are in proportion in the same ratio. So it also influences this number because it might grow significantly depending on how often we have to handle the overflows. Then as uh, we showed before a few slides ago, the vector memory fetch is also decreased uh, a lot by five and a half times. The same goes for the clock cycles that were decreased by six times and similar trend can be seen also in the energy dissipation, which was decreased by five and a half times. And the same trend applies for multiply accumulates and memory excesses. Again, we can see here that the memory excesses really dominate our inference with 109 nanojoules for the neural network engine and 600 nanojoules for the XDSP. So now I'd like to conclude uh, what I've been describing the past couple of minutes and what we've gone through together in this presentation. So we could see the implementation of a neural network on both the dedicated neural network engine as well as the XDSP. And we could see that with the three optimization techniques implemented in the neural network engine, which were word length reduction, 12 parallel multiply accumulates and dynamic two step scaling technique, we were able to outperform the XDSP significantly in all aspects, while actually the accuracy dropped by only 1% unit. So to wrap it up, our neural network engine uh, really provides low energy, low power, and it can be easily implemented in resource constrained embedded devices, such as hearing instruments. So I'd like to say thank you for your attention and I'm open to questions. Susanna, thank you very much for your great presentation. We have some questions from the audience. First question, more than one audience is asking if the DSP derived from um, a commercial source as ARM Tensilica, or did you design the ASIC in-house? Uh, this XDSP, this DSP that I was presenting, that's our own DSP from actually Oticon. Thank you. So what's the criteria to choose how many groups for two-step scaling and uh, the criteria to choose which neural belongs to, into each group? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So first of all, this uh, criteria is really depending on um, the memory interface. So how many basically elements we can fetch within a single clock cycle. In our case, we are limited by this 96-bit memory interface. And uh, since we decided to use eight bits for representing our parameters, this gives us basically groups of uh, 12 neurons or 12 elements that we can actually fetch at a time. And this also determined um, basically how we are splitting our groups of uh, neurons within a neural network. So based on this, we also split every um, layer into these groups of 12 neurons, and we are processing them also um, with these groups of 12 neurons at a time. Um, so basically this is um, the factor that decided how we are going to process um, the different inputs and the different neurons. And regarding the question um, how we are actually assigning the individual neurons into these different groups, it's very simple because we are taking basically the first 12 neurons and right after like the subsequent 12 neurons. So it's basically going um, one by one. Okay, thank you. So did you compare the efficiency of NNE with a GPU instead of DSP? Uh, no, we haven't compared it, um, at least not yet. Uh, the comparisons we have are between our neural network engine and the DSP. Okay. So is it limited to fully collected layers or does it support convolutional layers as well? 
Um, this accelerator that I was presenting uh, right now was uh, one of our experiments for fully connected neural networks. Of course, we are working on uh, creating an accelerator that is more robust so that it can um, support also convolutional neural networks or let's say recurring neural networks. But the one, once again, I was presenting here was purely for fully connected neural networks. So does your optimization apply strictly to feed-forward networks but not CNN or RNN? Um, the two, yeah, those three optimizations, well, especially in um, the case of uh, the two-step scaling method, um, there would, of course, have to be some adjustments when it comes to the convolutional neural networks because, once again, um, these were applied to the fully connected neural networks. But, um, of course, with some additional work, we can make it also um, apply also to the convolutional neural networks. Okay, so the last question, uh, did you try varying the cue point in the uh, quantization? Did, you, uh, did it change performance at all? Uh, we, we've tried that, but the performance was uh, not really changed because, again, we were working with, for example, this 8-bit data and um, changing this cue point, this fixed point, that was more about the final representation of the result. So it didn't really change anything in, uh, in our case. Thank you very much, Susanna. So, Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, so to be mindful of our time here, we will not be able to address all your questions during our live Q&A session. So for the unanswered questions, please visit our TinyML forum. We will answer them here. Thank you. So thanks again, our TinyML talk sponsors, Edge Impulse, Maximum Integrated, and SceneSense. So Edge Impulse, as Dan just introduced, provides the developer platform for ultra-low-power machine learning from design to deployment at scale. You can sign up at edgeimpulse.com to experience the smooth developer journey it offers. Maximum Integrated enables edge intelligence through sensors and signal conditioning on low-power ARM Cortex-M microcontrollers. Advanced AI acceleration features is coming soon. So SingSense uh, builds ultra-low-power sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. You can go to SingSense.ai to find more information. Again, on July 21st, we will have two talks from DSP Group and Qualcomm. Um, it's scheduled at 8 a.m. Pacific time. If you want to participate in our Tenny ML talk series, please email your proposal to talks at tennyml.org. Thank you very much for joining the session today and see you in two weeks.